Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. Um, this is our seventh, and I believe, final study on Israel and Zionism. Now, I'm saying I believe, I'm not guaranteeing that, but seven's a good number, right? It's a good place to stop. But before we get into our study for this morning, I want to add a few things from the last study we did called Zionism and the Land from last week. Do you remember what I said the land represented? All right, thank you. The land represents the presence of Yahweh. This is hard for us in our culture to understand things like this, but this is what they believed. When you were out of the land of Israel, you were out of God's presence. You were away from Him. And the land, we said, was a type. It was a picture. Well, this week I was reading 2 Kings, and this verse stood out to me because I was reading, reading it in the Christian Standard Bible, and it says this, Therefore Yahweh was very angry with Israel, and He removed them from His presence. Only the tribe of Judah remained. And I like the way the Christian Standard Bible translates the Hebrew here, panim. The, the Hebrew word panim means face. And so here he, they translate panim as presence. And you understand that if you're in somebody's face, you're in their presence, okay? So he removed them from his presence. Now, how did Yahweh remove? He's talking about <clears throat> the, the northern tribes here of Israel. How did he remove them from his presence? He took them out of the land. He sent Israel, the northern kingdom, into Assyrian captivity in 700 B.C. So out of the land equals away from God's presence. And then later in 2 Kings 23, 27, it says this, For Yahweh had said, I will also remove Judah from my presence. So the last verse we talked about, Israel was removed. Now he's saying, I'm going to also take Judah out, just as I have removed Israel. I will reject this city, Jerusalem, that I have chosen, and the temple about which I said my name will be there. Now, in 586 B.C., Judah was taken captive and removed from the land in the Babylonian captivity. And the Babylonian captivity really assimilated the Assyrian captivity because the Babylonians destroyed Assyrians. And so now all those who were the Assyrian captivity are part of the Babylonian captivity. And they're taken away out of the land of Israel. Now, if you understand this or if you're thinking about this, you might think, well, wait a minute, isn't God omnipresent? How do you get out of His presence? Well, Yahweh is omnipresence. And what that means is that all of God is in every place. Yahweh is capable of being everywhere at the same time. His divine presence encompasses the whole universe. There's no location where He does not inhabit. So how can we say we're out of the pres someone's in the presence or out of the presence of God? You, you can't literally be out of His presence. But when the scripture talks about being removed from his presence, it's to be out of his favor. So the land was a type, and the anti-type is the new covenant where believers are always in his presence. In the new covenant, all God's people dwell with God. Look what Revelation 21.3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be His people. And God Himself will be with them. So we are in the new covenant. In the new covenant, we are in His presence. And you talk about glorification. Glorification is really nothing more than dwelling in the presence of God. Believers, the Scriptures teach us that Christ is our life. He is in the presence of God, and therefore, we are in the presence of God. Now, we've been talking about Zionism as well as Christian Zionism. Zionism is just a political movement. Christian Zionism or Christians that agreed with that political movement. Okay? They not only put great emphasis on the land, we talked about that last week, but they focus on a rebuilt temple and another priesthood, and all because they failed to see these things as types. And so they look to the future for a rebuilt temple and another priesthood. Christian Zionism is a misunderstanding of the Bible. 
and it negatively affects our current politics. See, Christian Zionists are convinced that a future temple will be built in place or near the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And there's one major problem barring the construction of the future temple. And that obstacle is the second holiest place of the Muslim faith, and that is the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And so Christian Zionism, working toward the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, clearly has political ramifications which threaten to destabilize the entire Middle East. Because, I mean, these Zionists push the fact that we got to get in there, we got to destroy this mosque, we got to get rid of it, we got to run them off and rebuild our temple. Depends on how extreme they are. Some of them say, let's just build the temple next to the mosque. That'll go over well, too. Okay? But see, they actually want to destabilize the Middle East because they believe this will bring in Armageddon and we'll have this battle and it'll bring the return of Christ. All right? People, here's what we have to understand. What we believe affects how we behave. Okay? And the way we behave affects the world in which we live. Christian Zionism is a faulty theology that has many negative side effects. But I would guess that this is what most of the American church believes. So what drives this errant theology? Errant teachers. <laughs> okay? That's what drives it. A bunch of them. And this is why I tell you over and over and over, don't believe what I say, examine it, look at the scriptures, because you're not supposed to be believing people. You're supposed to be digging for yourself and finding out if this is true, because there's a lot of whack jobs out there teaching a lot of crazy stuff, and you're going to hear a lot of it this morning, all right? In his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, Hal Lindsey writes this, Religious Jews have prayed three times a day, May it be thy will that the temple be speedily rebuilt in our day. Now, first of all, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that the people that are over there in Israel, they're not religious Jews for the most part. Very few religious Jews over there, all right? It's just basically a political movement, something they're involved in. But I'll venture to say that Hal Lindsey probably prays this same prayer every day, even knowing that the chaos it would bring. In 1994, Lindsay predicted this. Two religions, Judaism and Islam, thus are on a collision course with global and heavenly repercussions. Islam will never accept, accept Jerusalem as the undivided capital of the Jewish state, and Israel will never agree to give it up. This is intractable and soluble crisis that will soon result in the climax of world history. So this is going to be this huge war, they're saying, you know, between Israel and Islam, and they're going to be fighting over this whole thing, and it's going to just be the climax of history. Everything's going to end here. Now, Randall Price, who is a Christian Zionist who teaches at Liberty University School of Divinity, he says this, Torah obligates the Jewish nation to rebuild the temple whenever it becomes possible to do so. Now, we talked again a couple weeks ago that the, the majority of Jews today hold to the Talmud, not the Torah. And the Talmud is a blasphemous work that calls Christ all kinds of names, mocks Him, ridicules Him. But I want you to notice here, he, he's saying that the Torah obligates them. Do you see his spoof text? In other words, you throw out a statement, let me give you a text to prove it, all right? Well, Exodus 25 proves this, right? And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So tell me this, how does this text teach that the Jewish nation is to rebuild the temple whenever it becomes possible? Do you see that in that text? This is a professor, okay, teaching this stuff. This is a scholar teaching this stuff. In this text, Yahweh is speaking to Moses about building the original tabernacle. And he's just telling him, he's already spent chapter after chapter laying out, here's what you do, here's how you do it, all this. It, and then he says, let them make me a sanctuary. It doesn't say anything there about it's whenever it's possible or anything like that, that I may dwell in their midst. Just finish this sanctuary. 
So let me ask you this. Does Yahweh still want a sanctuary to dwell in? Yes. The church. The church, okay? The church is His sanctuary. The dwelling place of God is with man. We just read that in Revelation 21.3. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Then Paul says, for we, Paul and the church, we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them, a walk among them, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, despite this truth that we are the temple of God, there are many groups today that are striving to rebuild the Jewish temple. Now, there's a group called the Temple Mount and Eretz Yisrael Faithful Movement. Most people just shorten it, the Temple Mount Faithful Movement, they call it, all right? It's an Orthodox Jewish movement based in Jerusalem whose goal is to rebuild which they call the Third Jewish Temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and reinstitute the practice of ritual sacrifice. So they want to build another temple, get another priesthood, go back to sacrificing animals. How many of you have ever heard of the Temple Mount Faithful Movement? None of you. That's what I figured, okay? In 1999, the U.S. Anti-Deflammation League included Gershon Solomon, who is the leader of the Temple Mount Faithful, on a list of threats to national security. All right, so that's the leader of this thing. Now, and yet, our neighbor right over here, Pat Robertson, in the Broadcasting Network, has assisted in fundraising for Gershon Solomon's Temple Mount Faithful. And he's not the only one. A lot of Christians are supporting these terrorist groups. See, Christian Zionists believe passionately that the rebuilding of the Jewish temple is eminent and actively support those committed to achieving it, even groups like the Temple Mount Faithful. So where do the Christian Zionists get the idea that there's a temple going to be built in the future? Where do they get that from? Well, they get it from twisting Scripture, all right? And I want to show you one of the main scriptures they use is Mark 13, 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation, standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Do you see how this verse supports the rebuilding of a third temple in our future? <laughs> Me neither, okay? <laughs> But I'll explain to you how they end up there. But now, as preterists, okay, we're familiar with this verse. We understand what this verse means. The abomination of desolation is the Roman army with its heathen images and standards ready to sacrifice to idols on the temple altar and working towards the desolation of Jerusalem and the temple. We know that the predicted abomination of de desolation mentioned by Yeshua is a thing of the past. It was fulfilled in the events of AD 66 to 70. We understand this. We know this. But John Walvoord, commenting on this verse in Mark, says this. Such a temple will be rebuilt and these prophecies literally fulfilled. So basically he's saying Jerusalem destruction in AD 70 wasn't literal enough for him. The temple was totally destroyed. Like Yeshua said, not one brick will be left upon another. The Jews were wiped out. They were taken into captivity. It was done. It was the end of the sacrificial system. Haven't sacrificed since. But that's not literal enough for John Walbert. So it has to be rebuilt. If upon this revival of their sacrificial system, such a future temple is suddenly desecrated, it would constitute a sign to the nation of Israel the, time, the coming time of the great trouble just preceding the second coming. So, what has to happen? That, what, that thing didn't count. All right, 87 didn't count. So, we need something to be rebuilt so it can be desiccated. It can be re totally destroyed. All right. Now, in this text in Mark, Yeshua is talking to his disciples, his real disciples in the first century, and he told them, When you see it, the abomination of desolation, not the Jews in general see it, not the Jews of some future generation. 
How would his disciples see it if it's still yet future? The Liberty Commentary says this. You must be taken generically. How, why do they say that? Well, since the disciples have not lived to see this take place. So the disciples didn't see it. That, that's their interpretation. Obviously, they're thinking they didn't see it, so it's got to be yet future. So here's, here's how this looks. Yeshua said to his disciples, you'll see it. The Liberty Commentary says they didn't see it. Who are you going to believe? Let's stick with Yeshua, okay? Let's not go with the Liberty Commentary, all right? People, understand this. The New Testament says nothing about a temple being set up in the future. Nothing at all. Now, the Tanakh talks about a rebuilt temple, but it's referring to the rebuilding of Solomon's temple, which is the very temple that Yeshua said was going to be destroyed. Yeshua was talking about an event that would happen in his generation. Now, contemporary Christian Zionists who have written on or about the rebuilding of the temple include Thomas Ice, Randall Price, Grant Jeffrey, Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, Dave Hunt. And here's the problem with this. Their combined published book sales exceed 70 million in more than 50 languages. Their views are therefore influential, and they really needed to be, they need to be confronted with Scripture. This is their views, and that's why so many people hold this theology. And we need to take the Scriptures and say, this is what the Bible says. Their views are endorsed by some of the largest theological colleges and missionary institutions, as well as a significant portion of evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal, and fundamentalist Christians worldwide. I said, this is a predominant view. Christian Zionists see the founding of the state of Israel in 1948 and the capture of Jerusalem in 1967 as highly significant. They think these, these things signal the end of the 2,000 years of exile and the end times of the Gentiles. So they're united with Jewish Zionists in the conviction that the Muslim Dome of the Rock must be destroyed. The third Jewish temple built, priests consecrated, and sacrifices reinstituted, which they say is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and ensures the coming of Messiah. Does it bother anybody that they talk about the sacrificial system being reinstituted? When I was a dispensationalist, I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. If you understand the whole sacrificial system pointed to Christ, every animal that was sacrificed pointed to the fact that man needs someone to shed their blood for him. All right? When Christ showed up on the scene, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Oh, they understood that, the sacrifice. But now Christ came, he sacrificed his life, and they said, Okay, so that was a type. Christ is the anti-type, the fulfillment. Well, now we're going back to the type. What is the point of that? What do we sacrifice? What are they sacrificing for? To point to Christ coming again or something? I, it just makes no sense at all. It's totally ridiculous. It goes against the whole book of Hebrews. Hal Lindsey writes this Obstacle or no obstacle, it is certain that the temple will be rebuilt. Prophecy demands it. When you say something like that, it sounds authoritative, doesn't it? The Bible says this has to happen. No, it does not. But that doesn't matter. See, if you say it does, then people are like, oh, wow, okay, it must be right. Within the Jewish nation reborn in the land of... Why, with the Jewish nation reborn in the land of Palestine, ancient Jerusalem once again under total Jewish control for the first time in 2,600 years, the talk of rebuilding the great temple, the most important sign of Jesus Christ soon coming is before us. So this is, we get, see, Yeshua can't come back until we get this temple built because we got to get it built so it can be destroyed so we can come back. You got all that? It's like the key piece of the jigsaw puzzle being found. For all those who trust in Jesus Christ, it's a time of electrifying excitement. <laughs> We're all excited about this huge, massive war that's going to take place and all these people that are going to die. You ever read the book of Revelation about the deaths and the blood? We, we're excited about this. 
John Walvoord writes this about the book, Ready to Rebuild, by Thomas Ice and Randall Price. It's about, we're ready to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. He says, something is happening in Israel. For many years, there's been speculation as to whether the second temple, destroyed in AD 70, will ever be rebuilt. Even though, again, Scripture predicts it. No, it does not. Now you can, how can Scripture predict the rebuilding of that temple when that temple wasn't destroyed until after Scripture was finished being written? Good question there, huh? Now you can read the startling evidence. He's talking about the book. The move is already underway. This fascinating, fast-moving overview of contemporary events shows why the temple is significant in Bible prophecy and how, more than ever, Israel is ready to rebuild a masterpiece presenting all the various views with substantiating evidence, a mine of information for those concerned about prophecy, a solid base for faith and what can actually be expected in regard to the rebuilding of the temple, it is highly recommended. Now this speculation about the rebuilding of the temple is largely the consequence of a futuristic, literalistic hermeneutic. Now, do you know what I mean when I say a literalistic hermeneutic? I mean, some people read the Bible and everything is just literal. That's exactly what's going to happen, okay? And they don't understand apocalyptic language. They don't understand metaphors. They don't understand types and anti. They don't understand any of that. So everything's literal. Well, here's what Schofield wrote. C.I. Schofield, he's, you know, one of the promoters, one of the inventors of this whole system. He says this, not one instance exist of a spiritual or figurative fulfillment of prophecy. Jerusalem always is always Jerusalem. Israel is always Israel. Zion is always Zion. Prophecies may never be spiritualized, but are always literal. Anybody got a problem with that? I could say, well, what about um, Romans 9.6? They are not Israel that are of Israel. One of those can't be literal, right? If, if everybody in Israel is not Israel, then what's going on there? Maybe, I don't know, maybe Schofield never read that. But let me prove Schofield wrong really quickly here, okay? I already did with that verse. But Malachi writes this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. All right, this is a prophecy of the coming of Elijah. Now, some rabbis taught that, that the prophet Elijah, who was caught up to heaven, would reappear. Literally, this, he would reappear. But in the New Testament, we learn that John the Baptist is the Elijah of Malachi. The disciples knew the prophecy about Elijah. Apparently, they thought it would be fulfilled physically, that Elijah himself would actually come back. It was actually, literally fulfilled but not physically fulfilled. And this is an important interpretive principle. Something can be fulfilled literally and spiritually, but not physically. John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, the conviction that the temple must be rebuilt is based on the assumption that certain prophecies in the Tanakh referring to the temple have not yet been fulfilled. One of the most frequently quoted passages by Christian Zionists is Daniel chapter 9. Let's just look at it and see what Daniel 9 really tells us. He says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. All right, Daniel is a Jew, so he's talking about the Israelites, the Jewish people. He's talking about Jerusalem. That's his holy city. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit. That's an interesting phrase there, to seal both vision and profit. You can look this up in almost anybody, any commentary, see what anybody's got to say. In it. And the funny thing about this phrase is almost everybody's in agreement. That's rare. But what this phrase means, it means all prophecy is given and fulfilled at this time. All right? And like I said, when you get everybody agreeing on it, that's kind of interesting. And to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build, build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, 
it shall be built again with squares and moat. But in a troubled time, and after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off, and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now the city being destroyed here is Jerusalem. It's the temple we're talking about. Who are the people of the prince? Those are the Jews. All right? They're the ones responsible for this. Its end shall come with the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations, all right, the city's going to be destroyed. We talked about that. Let's move on. Shall come who makes desolate. All right, this here's the abomination of desolation that we read about in the text in Mark. Until the decree end is poured out on the desolate. Now, commenting on this text, Hal Lindsey argues, this prophecy speaks of sacrifice and offerings which demand that the Jews rebuild the temple for a third time. So Daniel's talking about the rebuilding of a temple for the third time. I, I don't. We we just skip one. We just the, the see what happened in eighty seventy when the temple was destroyed. They just totally skip over that. Like, well, that didn't count. So we're not. We're going to pretend it doesn't even exist, and we'll just move on. He says upon its original site. Yeah, did you see that in that passage in Daniel about the? Yeah, that was in there, right? And that point, Judaism and Islam will be placed on an inevitable course of war over the site. A war that will start Armageddon. See, that's, they're actually looking forward to that. Any move toward that direction is a crucial clue that what hour is on God's prophetic timetable. All right, they don't have a clue about the prophetic timetable of God. All right, they're so far off. The problem with this is that there's nothing in the text of Daniel 9 that requires a futuristic scenario or predicts the rebuilding of a Jewish temple. This prophecy is about the destruction of the temple that took place in AD 70. Why do we need something rebuilt after that? He's talking about that one. Now, Moshe Rosen, who follows a futuristic, literal reading, he claims that Ezekiel 43 refers to a contemporary events leading to an eminent rebuilding of the temple. And, and a lot of them hold this view the fact that uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48 is talking about another temple, and they think this is a future temple that's going to be rebuilt. He says, at some point in these stressful days, the ancient Jewish temple will be rebuilt on the Holy Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Prophecy foretells the rebuilding of the Jewish temple and the reinstitution of sacrifices prescribed in the law of Moses. All right, so here's what's interesting. If you read Ezekiel 40 through 48, all these descriptions about the temple. Here's, here's the measurement for this. Here's the measurement for that. It's really good. It's not a literal temple. How do we know that? It's clear from the descriptions given. If you pay attention and read all the descriptions, people say, well, this is a detailed plan to rebuild this other temple. No, it's not a detailed plan because there's some things left out. All right? If you read the measurements, you got width, you got depth, you don't have anything about height. No height measurements in that description at all. In other words, does this thing just go on forever or what? How, how, there's nothing mentioned about a roof at all. So it's just like this is just an open place. There's, I mean, come on, that doesn't sound really good, just wide open like that. There's nothing in there. Never a clear description for a roof. How in the world would you build it when there's no height descriptions? But people overlook that. See, and this tells us this is not a literal temple. This is talking about the true temple, God's temple, His church, His people. The most important New Testament passage, though, that's used to support the belief in the rebuilding of the Jewish temple is Matthew 24, 1 and 2, and verse 15. Now, and Matthew, this is Matthew's text on Mark 13, 14 about the abomination of desolation. And while dispensationalists argue that in the first two verses, Yeshua's warning of the imminent destruction of Jerusalem. That makes sense. How do you get around that? Yeshua's walking out and the disciples say, Hey, Lord, you see all these temples? You see all these buildings? And he goes, yeah, not one of them will be left 
with stone upon another. It's going to all be destroyed. And they're like, okay. So they agree. Yes, he's talking about that. But then they say, when you get down to verse 15, he's describing the destruction of a future temple. We just jumped, okay? He's talking about this temple. He's explaining to them what's going to happen. And now he jumps. And this futurist interpretation of Matthew 24, like that of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, requires a gap of some 2,000 years between the verses. All of a sudden, we got this gap in there. He's speaking about one temple, now he's talking about another temple. John Walvoord argues this. This prediction obviously could not refer to A.D. 70, as it's an event immediately preceding the second advent of Christ, described in Matthew 24, 27. Now, you see why he says it can't be talking about A.D. 70? Because this happens at the second coming, and the second coming didn't happen. So... There's got to be a third temple. So at least you can follow why, how they're getting there, okay? They don't believe Christ came. He said he was. They didn't believe he did. He said soon. They said not soon. He said quickly. They said no. He said this generation. They said some other generation, okay? So, so they believe this couldn't have happened. The prediction, however, gives us the clue concerning the future temple. The abomination of desolation has reference to a future event paralleling to some extent the abomination that makes desolate of Daniel 11.31, fulfilled in the desolation of the temple in the 2nd century B.C. by Antiochus Epiphanes, which sparked the Maccabean revolt. So he says, see, this is talking about that. People, this is their strong verse. This is one of their strongest verses to, to point to a future temple. And there's nothing in there about a future temple. Hal Lindsey takes a similar view. He said, of course, for the temple rites to be stopped in the last days, we know they must be restarted. The words of Jesus himself in Matthew 24, 15, require that a new holy place be built and a complete sacrificial system reinstituted. Because the one that was happening at the time couldn't be the one. We couldn't use that one, so we got to have another one. And since only a consecrated temple can be defiled... The prophecy shows that the physical temple must not only be rebuilt, but a functioning priesthood must begin practicing once again. Now, that is really interesting, okay? <laughs> because they are going through all kinds of things. You know, to have a functioning priesthood, you need genealogical records. They don't have them. When the temple was destroyed in 8070, the genealogical records were destroyed because God's saying, I'm done with this system. I don't want you doing this anymore, so no more records. Another thing you need to have a priesthood is what? You ever heard of the red heifer? Okay, you got to have a red heifer because you got to have the ashes of the red heifer to purify the priesthood so they can operate. So, there's a place in America where they're breeding red heifers. Now, uh, you know, so they're, they're going through all this stuff. I mean, they have all this stuff in place that they're working on right now. They have priests picked out. They have guys that they think are going to, you know, be able to stand in the gap. Well, Lindsay actually adds a few words to the Scripture when he uses it to help you understand this. This is Matthew 24, 15 in Lindsay's translation. Therefore, when you see the abomination which was spoken through of Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then he puts this in, of the rebuilt temple. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Talk about adding words to Scripture. Let's just throw that in there of the rebuilt temple, because I want you to understand we're not talking about the temple that the people Yeshua was talking to understood. We've got a rebuilt one. Now, while Lindsay and Walvoord believe Yeshua was predicting a future desecration of a rebuilt temple, preterists know that his words were fulfilled in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 8070. It all fits perfectly with that time period. So when Yeshua promised these events would be witnessed by this generation, Lindsay understand the word this to refer to his own generation, Lindsay's generation, who had witnessed the founding of the state of Israel in 1948 and the capture of the old city of Jerusalem in 1967. Lindsay writes, So the rebuilding of the temple is significant, not only because of the potential firestorm it will create between Jews and Muslims in the Middle East, it also is a critical development in the entire prophetic scenario. The Bible makes it clear that in the last days, the Antichrist will establish his reign in the temple of Jerusalem. 
Therefore, the temple must and will be rebuilt. Now, the Christian Zionist finds evidence for the rebuilding of the future temple in the instructions given to John to measure the temple in Revelation 11. And I love this. This is, you know, but it helps you kind of get their mindset here. In Revelation 11, John is told, take a read and go measure the temple. All right, and for, from a preterist point of view, we're saying, well, if he's measuring the temple, there must be a temple to measure, which means this is prior to A.D. 70. And we understand the dating of the Revelation to be in the late 60s. But, see, our futurists, our dispensational brothers of Zionists, they believe the book was written in 96. There's a tremendous book out there by Gentry called, um, what? Yeah, okay, thanks. You go fly. No. Come on, guys. Everybody knows the name of that book. Before Jerusalem Fell. Thank you. <laughs> the book is called Before Jerusalem Fell. It's almost 400 pages, and it's all about the dating of the book of Revelation. So you've got about 400 pages explaining the date of the book. It is thorough. It is very thorough. But it's worth a read because he went to the point, he wanted to prove the point. Listen, this book was written earlier, all right? Well, here's what Lindsay writes. The Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation about the year A.D. 95. Okay, if he did, he says, this means that the temple was non-existent for the 25 years preceding John's writing. That would be true if it was written in 95. What temple then was John referring to? So he's supposed to measure the temple, but there is no temple. So there can only be one answer, a yet-to-be structure. How's he going to measure it if it's not yet there? Go measure that temple. It's not there yet, but go measure it. And John's like, um, how do you measure something that's not here? Oh, people, this, <laughs> this, really, this theology really requires you to just take some leaps of faith. Okay? Don't believe the Scripture. Just take some real leaps of faith. All right, it's on the basis of these passages that a literal logic that Christian Zionists believe the Bible promises a future temple will be built in order to be desecrated and destroyed once it's built. All right, so listen, if they tell you the Lord's coming soon, you say, not yet. First of all, we've got to get rid of the Dome of the Rock. Then we've got to rebuild the temple. Then the temple's got to be destroyed. That's going to take a little bit of time, right? Okay, if the temple, if the Dome of the Rock gets removed and you see them start building a temple, then you're like, okay, now it's getting closer. But don't buy the soon stuff if, if all this has to happen, and yet they still, they're still saying that, all right? Okay, that's enough of that nonsense for a while. Let's look at what the scriptures say about a rebuilt temple. Let's look at what Paul says about the temple in Ephesians 2. Writing to the church, he writes this, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints... And you're members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Yeshua himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. All right, now he says here that it's built on this foundation. And the thing that's being built is not just an ordinary building, it's the temple that he's talking about, where Yahweh manifests his presence in a very special way. Yahweh is omniscient, but there's a special sense in which he dwells in his temple. And the Jews experience this as the Shekinah, the glory, the fire cloud over the temple, the brilliant manifestation of the glory of God. You know, if you understand what's going on, have you ever seen the pictures of the tabernacle set up with the fire over it, the pillar of fire? I mean, here's Israel, they're camping, they look up, and at night there's this huge pillar of fire right over the tabernacle. And then day there's a cloud, and they just follow this thing wherever it leads. And then they get mad at Moses and say, why have you brought us out here? Pastor Moses said, uh, you see that pillar over there that we're following around here? People wake up, okay? This is ridiculous. Please notice that this new temple is not built on the foundation of the Mosaic Law. It's built on the teachings of the apostles about Yeshua the Christ. Christ himself being the cornerstone. 
The cornerstone was the major stone that was set down, and every other part of that building works from that cornerstone. He, the builder would place the cornerstone, the rest of the building would grow out from it. So the cornerstone was the thing that framed everything. It was the thing in which everything was adapted. It was the support, it was the unifier, it was the connector, the strength giver to that building. And Yeshua is that cornerstone. Now he says, in whom the whole structure is being joined together. The word for structure here is the Greek oikodome. It's used by classical writers of a building or the act of building. In the present context, oikodome has to refer to the act of building because of the following participle and main verb denotes that the building is still in the process of construction. All right, so Paul's writing to the Ephesians about this building that's being built. And the building that's being built is the temple of God. It's the new Jerusalem. And he says that believers are this temple of God. He says a holy temple. So the believers are being built into a temple for God to dwell in. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Now Paul uses the plural here to emphasize that the entire church, the community of God's people, is God's temple. God dwells here. God doesn't dwell in a sanctuary. We are His sanctuary, the church. And a little later Paul says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own. This refers to the body of each believer. Paul's use of the singular form body here may emphasize that each believer is a temple of God. See, in this context, Paul focuses on individual believers instead of the entire church community. One is individual, the other is corporate. It's a plural pronoun. So both corporately and individually, we are the dwelling place of God. We saw this already, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them. Look what he's saying here. Among them. Walk among them. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Paul is quoting here from Leviticus 26, 12. Which this is, uh, God spoke this to Israel, and yet Paul's saying this is being fulfilled in the church. Because the church is the true Israel of God. Look what Peter says about this temple. As you come to him, a living stone, he's referring to Christ as a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. So he's talking about the believers. You believers are living stones. You're being built in a spiritual house to a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Yeshua the Christ. So these first century believers were being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The church is a temple, and the temple was where worship was carried on. And these believers are worshiping. They're offering spiritual sacrifices. All right, back to our text. This temple grows, he says, into a holy temple. Now the present tense verb here along with the preceding participle shows that continuance of growth process indicating this is a living organism. That's, this is not a normal building, people. It continues to increase. And, and it's not in the future tense looking forward to some eschatological temple in the future. It's the present tense dealing with the present temple that is not finished in the first century but is continuing to grow. Now the Greek word for temple here is naos which means the inner sanctuary, the holy of holies. There's another word for temple, hieros, which would be the temple porches, the outbuildings, the temple grounds. He says, being built together into a dwelling place for God. So this temple is being built so God can come dwell here. We see in verse 21 that the building is still in the process of construction. It's growing into a holy temple. The present tense verb shows the continuance of the growth. And verse 22 talks about ongoing process of the building that is being built. Again, in the first century. This growing process can only be understood by someone who understands fulfilled eschatology. Why? Because only they know what time it is. See, this building is no longer being built. 
But so many people take their Bibles and they say, look at we're, we are being built into a dwelling place of God. No, that was written in the first century to first century Christians. Listen, the building is no longer being built. Why? Because they finished it. <laughs> they finished it in the first century and God moved in. So it's not going on anymore. All right? He moved in. But most people see this as a process. John MacArthur writes this. And it grows. The temple grows. Why? New stones are being added all the time. And he's talking about Christians coming to faith in Christ. Well, people are coming to faith in Christ all the time, but the temple's not growing anymore. It was finished. Yahweh indwelt it, moved in as it. This is the new temple that is promised throughout the Tanakh. It wasn't a literal building again. It was God living in His people. Look at Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. He says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. People, this is what began to happen at Pentecost. At Pentecost, all those nations that God had put away are coming back into the temple of God, coming back into fellowship with God. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that He may teach us His ways, that we may walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. So Isaiah is talking about the new living temple. Now dispensationalism and Christian Zionism, they put great emphasis on a rebuilt physical temple and priesthood because they fail to see the type. They don't know that the antitype has come. Physical Israel was a type. So was the tabernacle a type. Paul says this in Hebrews. I mean, the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 8. Barnabas, not Paul. He says, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. All these words, copy, shadow, pattern, they're all talking about types. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you in the mountain. So the writer of Hebrews is saying this whole tabernacle and this whole system was a type that pointed to the anti-type and Yeshua is that anti-type. He tells us this in John chapter 2, the scripture that was read this morning. He says, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? See, in this time period, it was expected that when Messiah came, he would repeat the signs of Moses. So they're saying, him, you know, do you have some sign? So Yeshua said, yeah, I'll give you a sign. He answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And man, they freaked out over this. And I want to say here, hey, Schofield, is this, pro is this a prophecy? Is this literal? Is this going to be, you know, destroy this temple? He's going, to, he's going to raise up in three days another one. Remember what he said. Schofield said, not one instance exists of a spiritual or figurative fulfillment of prophecy. Well, is this temple a literal temple then? No, it's not. And the word for temple here again is naos which indicates the sanctuary of the temple, the holy of holies, the place where God dwelt. So he said, destroy this. Now the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin later used Yeshua's words about destroying the temple as a capital charge against him at his trial. But that's really dishonest because Yeshua said, destroy the temple, not I will destroy it. And furthermore, Yeshua made it clear he was speaking of his body. So the sign that Yeshua gives them is his resurrection. They would destroy the temple, his body, and he would rise in three days. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Listen, at the time of Yeshua was here at present, this temple was still not finished. It's been 46 years they've been building it, and it still wasn't done. Okay? So when he says, I'll do it in three days, they're like, whoa, this, this is not right here. Okay? But Lazarus makes it clear for us. He said he was speaking about the temple of his body. So his resurrection was going to be the sign from heaven that ultimately validates his claim to be the Son of God. And ever since the temple's rebuilding, after the return from the Babylonian exile in the 6th century B.C., the temple of Jerusalem had been an empty house. And this is, I think, important to understand. If you read Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 10 and 11, it talks about the Spirit of God departing from the temple. 
In other words, God said, you people are so messed up. I'm done. I'm leaving this place. I got nothing to do with this anymore. And from then on, that was an empty house. They rebuilt this temple. Okay, Herod's temple, they rebuilt it. It was an empty house. God had never taken possession of the temple in the way he filled the tabernacle. Remember when, when God came upon the tabernacle in Exodus 40, it just, he filled a place. Same thing with Solomon's temple. But in Herod's temple, the time, the second temple here, the Holy of Holies was an empty room. The priests went into an empty room and pretended to do some ritual because there was nothing there. Nothing in there. Because the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. It was gone. Well, see, so Yahweh had left the temple. He'd left there, and now he came back in the person of Yeshua. So the glory of God is now coming back in Yeshua. And the body of the risen Christ is the spiritual temple from which the living waters of salvation flow. Yeshua is declaring his body, himself personally, and his body, the church, to be the true temple. So we don't need some rebuilt temple. The physical re resurrection of Christ's body is the foundation of his new covenant people being constituted as the temple. Yeshua replaces the temple itself. He is the antitype of the temple. The temple represented the presence of God among his children, and Christ now represents that. Now, look at this text in Acts 2. This is Pentecost. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. What's the significance of this tongues of fire on them? Well, throughout the scriptures, fire is always a sign of the presence of God. We talked about during the temple, the Shekinah, the glory of God would shine over that tabernacle. Well, note how at Pentecost, the manifestation of the flaming presence of Yahweh is not positioned over a tent or a temple as it was in the Old Covenant. This time, the flame is over the people. Why? Because they are the new temple, the dwelling place of God. Yahweh is descending in fire on the new temple of His people by the Spirit. This is the promise of the new covenant where Yahweh would dwell with His people. Now, the building that Paul talked about in Ephesians 2 is the new Jerusalem. Look at what John writes, 21, 1 and 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared for a bride, a daughter for her husband. Now, people look at this and they say, oh, yeah, this is happening in the future. Well, this is talking about the new covenant. The building is now finished and God comes down to dwell in it. Notice that the new heaven and the new earth, he says the new heaven and new earth, is the new Jerusalem. They're the same thing. According to scripture, the new Jerusalem is the new covenant, which everybody believes we're in. But look at Galatians 4, 24 through 26. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Not present today. Present when this was written. All right, the physical temple of Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. So we got two covenants. Well, that, that one, that temple that existed at that time, was the bondage. He says, but the Jerusalem above is free. And she's our mother. So he's speaking about two covenants, old and new. The old is Mount Sinai, the new is the new Jerusalem above. So the new Jerusalem is the new covenant. It is the new heaven and the new earth. Now notice the dimensions of this new Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 16. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stata. Now watch what he says. Its length and its width and its height are equal. What do you got? A cube. a cube, right? So what's the significance of a cube? The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle was a cube. Okay? And again, so he's saying the New Jerusalem is a perfect cube. This is the Holy of Holies. 
that was in the tabernacle. The Holy of Holies was the dwelling place of God. So now God is dwelling with His people. Revelation 21.3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven, from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. God moved into this at the end, in AD 70, when He destroyed that old temple, He moved into His new temple. In the new covenant, which is the new Jerusalem, which is the new temple, that's where Yahweh dwells with His people. Believers, we live in the new covenant. Thus we are in the temple of the new Jerusalem, dwelling with Yahweh now. Believers, the church is God's temple, which was completed in AD 70. And our God is not up there, out there somewhere. He is with us. He dwells with us. We are His people. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to a building somewhere to worship God, because God lives in you. I think it's sickening that they call a place where they worship the sanctuary. Let's go into the sanctuary. I am the sanctuary. That'll freak them out. Tell them that, okay? <laughs> what do you mean you are the? I'm the sanctuary. That's where God dwells. Does God dwell in some empty room somewhere? Not unless the people who have Him go in there, all right? He's with us. He dwells with His people. What we have to understand is the shadow has been replaced with reality. The anti-type has replaced the type. And since the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, there are no more sacred buildings or sacred places. And there never will be. Because God dwells in us. No more buildings. Yeshua himself is our temple. There's no purpose for a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. The things they're looking for, the things they're hoping for, the things they're praying for have already happened. Now how sad is that? To work for something in a future that you already have now and you can't enjoy it. Because you're hoping it's going to come sometime later. We meet with God in the person of Yeshua. We dwell in Him. And He dwells in us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. Lord, give us the heart of Bereans that we would search the Scripture to see if things, things are so. Lord, there are so many different voices out there saying so many different things about your Bible. Help us to be discerning, Lord. Help us to dig into it for ourselves and compare Scripture with Scripture and find out if these things are so, to find out if these things are true. Help us, every one of us, Lord, not to follow man, but to take what we hear to the Scriptures and see if it's so. Thank you for your grace to us, Lord. Amen. All right, questions, comments? Gary? Well, one thing, I don't remember your exact statement, but you said, as predators, we know or something, or we believe that it would be better as Bereans, we know. But predators, a lot of predators don't exactly search and don't believe, but as Bereans, we, we hopefully have searched and found out. Um, <clears throat> Well, that's the key. If you don't understand what time it is, because most people interpreting the Bible believe that things that are spoken of as future as future to us. They don't realize it was written 2,000 years ago to those people, and what was future to them is past to us. So that, that's important to understand those things. But yeah, we are, I think we are all called to be Bereans, to search it, to find out if it's so, not just to blindly believe things we hear. Because I don't care where, you know, if you look at the health industry, oh my word, everybody's got a different opinion. They take, coffee is great for you, another article. Coffee will kill you. And then the next day it switches back. And the same thing with everything. And it's the same in the church. And that's why it's got to be frustrating. It's got to be confusing for people. But the cool thing is, everybody's got a Bible. Or can have one. And all we have to do is do some research. Do some digging. Um, you don't have a Bible? I'll get you one. <laughs> um, the city, the holy city coming down from above, am I hearing things or have there been people talking about how many people that city will hold? Yeah, well, they talk of... <laughs> 
they talk of the dimension. If you look at the literal dimensions of that city and you bring it to Earth, global Earth, it would just boom, squash it. It's too big to even fit, okay? So, again, it's not a literal thing, all right? Quiet. Then. Questions, comments? I'm trying to say that <laughs> diplomatically. Stan? I guess the whole thing that gets me about the sacrificial system is they sacrifice Christ over and over again, but this sacrifice wasn't enough. Well, that's, I mean, if you got to rebuild the system, why? Was what he did not enough? It didn't work, so we're going back to animals? You know, the writer of Hebrews says the blood of the bulls and goats will never take away sin. They only pointed to Christ. Uh, now that's, like I said, that's one of the things of the system that I just never could buy into. I just, no, I could, because I read the book of Hebrews. Yeah. All right, anybody else? You done? Oh, I didn't check my phone. Sorry. All right, Mike Sullivan says, some dispensationalists such as Schofield give the farm away by claiming that it's possible that the sacrifices of Ezekiel's temple prophecy in Ezekiel 40:48 are not to be interpreted literally. Well, that sounds weird from Schofield, doesn't it? <laughs> it's got to be literal. Yeah, it's, that's the thing. They go back and forth. They're not consistent. Uh, hang on. Uh, Gary Cole asked the question, what will the dispensationalist mantra be when the calendar reads AD 2050 or AD 2100? You know, they'll just keep saying the same thing. The clock was stopped. Remember, God stopped the clock because the church, his people rejected him. The Jews rejected Christ, so the soon didn't mean soon because we stopped. We're not, time is not moving in this realm of fantasy that we're living in. And so they can stretch it out as long as they want until they start the clock again. Oh, now it's soon. All right. So they have a lot of out there. Uh, Junior, again, not Bob Cruikshank Jr., but Junior from Canada, says Hebrews 9.11, a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is not of this creation. That's the whole thing. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. Yeah, but a lot of them, they just don't read it. Oh, a good question here. I don't know who this is from, uh, but it says, If nothing was in the Holy of Holies, what was the purpose for the veil torn at crucifixion? I think that was the purpose, to show nothing's here, nobody's home. This is a sham worship. This is over. It's done. Okay? There's nothing there. There was a stone in there that they, you know, uh, I don't know, they describe it as some kind of stone, but if you just, you know, read, you know that the tap, the, Ark of the Covenant was captured, all right, they lost it somehow in one of the wars, they don't know where it is, so there's nothing in that tabernacle, and, and it's so funny that the priest goes in once a year, he's supposed to sprinkle blood, and there's nothing there, so I guess he's going in there, and what am I doing here, you know, pretending he's doing something, it was all a sham, and I really think that's why that curtain was torn, to say nothing in there, look. I don't know. They got along without it for a long time. Maybe they don't need it anymore. And what does Jeremiah tell us about the Ark of the Covenant? It'll never come to mind or be thought of again. It's gone. It's done. All right. I'm going to close in prayer. We're late. We'll do a, we'll do a closing song later. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. Lord, I pray that we would continue to study and dig and learn and, and be the people you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that our understanding of Scripture would affect the way in which we live. We'd live, Lord, as your temple. We'd live as image bearers of you. And the things we say and the acts we perform, that people would see you in us. 
Help us, Lord, to carry you to the world in which we live. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. Amen.